Hi and welcome to this Grade Academy lecture. My name is Lise Kilgariff and in today's class what we're going to be looking at are the chemical characteristics of soil. So we've looked already at the physical characteristics, we've looked at the different soil types, but today what we're going to be dealing with is the chemical characteristics of soil. So in relation to the chemical properties of the chemical characteristics of soil, there's four main areas that we're going to be having a look at. So we're going to look at flocculation. What is that and how it affects the soil and why it's really important that, you know, there is certain flocculation um, and, and I suppose really the certain elements that will allow flocculation to occur. We will also look at cation exchange and cation exchange capacity, what is that? And why certain types of soil are better at cation exchange than other types of soil. We'll also look at soil pH, what's that? How would that affect the soil? Um, and again, how that affects plant growth, because remember everything that affects the soil is going to ultimately have an effect on plant growth. And then we're also going to look at colloidal properties um, and how they will affect the soil and the structure and really the chemical aspects of it. So we're looking in depth at the soil. We're, we're not looking physically at the soil, like, you know, on a physical nature. We're looking in depth at the chemical reactions really that occur within the soil. So on a very, very um, small level is what we're looking at here. So clay and humus particles are very chemically active as they are the smallest particle present, present in any type of soil. So we looked already in the previous video that the main components of soil are sand, silt and clay. Sand being the largest, silt, middle and then clay is the smallest. Clay is very, very small and so is humus. They both have positive and negative charges on their surface and so will attract the opposite charge to what they have because opposite things in chemistry will always attract one another and that's really really important to get. So particles with positive charges are called cations. Now if anybody does chemistry you're probably familiar with the term cation and anion. If you don't do chemistry a way that um, is kind of useful to remember it is that cation has a T and a T kind of look like, looks like a positive. So cations are positive charges. So that might help you to remember it, okay? Um, anions then are the opposite and anions have a negative charge. So when we're looking at things from a chemical aspect, things either have a, the majority of things either have a positive or a negative charge and they will, op, they will attract each other because they have an opposite charge. So the first thing we're going to look at is soil pH. What is it? How does it affect plants? How does it affect the soil? And you know, why, why are we studying it really? So what is pH? So pH is a measure of the acidity or the alkalinity of a soil. And it refers to the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. Now already from junior cycle, you'll be familiar with the fact that it's how acidic or how alkaline um, a substance is, so whether it's soil or whether it's any other chemical, but what's important to know at leave insert level is that it is the concentration of hydrogen ions and the hydrogen ions will have an effect on the um, pH or the acidity or alkalinity of a certain substance. So that's important. That's what pH means and they will be looking for you to know that it's the concentration of hydrogen ions. If the pH changes, a plant may not be able to, to use the soil as as much as they would like, you know, they may not be able to absorb water from it, air from it, minerals from it, and they may die as a result, okay? Um, so pH also affects the minerals um, absorbed by the plants. So hydrogen and aluminium ions are acidic. So when they dominate, the soil will be acidic. So where we have lots of hydrogen and lots of aluminium ions naturally present in the soil, the soil will be acidic. We also have ions that are alkaline and they are calcium and magnesium. And where they dominate, the soil will be a little bit more alkaline. So acidic meaning that the pH will be less than seven and alkaline mean that it's greater than seven. Earthworms and soil bacteria generally thrive in neutral conditions. So they will like a pH of about seven. If it's maybe 6.5 to 7.5, they can manage that. But anything really outside of that small pH range, they struggle with. And they don't really like to be in an area um, that hasn't the correct pH. And so if the soil is too acidic or too alkaline, 
what's going to happen is your plants can't use it because they can't absorb the minerals and also earthworms and smaller microorganisms won't live there and so they're not going to be of benefit to the soil and um, so as i said 6.5 to 7.5 is the optimum um, ph for living organisms but also for plant growth it can be um slightly outside of that but that's really the optimum so the optimum temperature or the optimum ph in in science always means the best okay in Ireland, soils tend to become acidic with time, and most soils need to be limed. So adding lime is um, kind of a chalky substance, um, and when you add lime to soil, it will raise the pH. So if you've noticed that your soil, and how you would know the pH of your soil, is you can do a soil test, and that will tell you lots of information about soils. And if you do, if you notice that maybe your crops aren't growing as well as they should be, and you do a soil test, and it comes back that the pH of your soil is quite low, then what you can do is you can lime the soil. So you're adding, adding this powdery substance to your soil, and really what you're doing is you need to wait a, kind of really two years um, to see the results of that. But what it will do is over time, it will increase the pH of the soil to make it a little bit more neutral going to alkaline you don't want your soils to be too much on the end of acidic or alkaline because the plants won't use them and when the plants can't use the soil and use the minerals in the soil they're not going to grow very well so lime is calcium carbonate it is a base so that's why it will um, increase the ph of the soil so granite and sandstone will be kind of acidic soils whereas basalt and limestone would be more alkaline soils so how you can measure the pH is by a pH meter. Um, so you, a lot of you probably might use that in the lab. Um, so if you just mix your soil and your water, you can add this pH probe and it'll give you a fairly accurate reading. You can obviously use the universal indicator paper. Um, you can use the universal indicator solution, but I suppose the pH meter is very, very accurate. If you are a farmer, and I suppose on a large scale, you mightn't have a pH meter. So what a lot of farmers would do is they would do a soil test. A soil test is carried out by Chagas, and that will determine, um, just like you know, if you get blood done at the doctor, that will determine the amounts of, of different substances in the body. It's the same really with the soil test, okay? So colloidal properties are the second thing that we're going to have a look at. So clay and humus are colloids. This means that they can take in water, which makes their particles swell up. So they're quite good at absorbing water um, and water is needed for chemical reactions in the soil. It's needed for plant hydration and it's also going to be a good solvent to bring minerals around the, the plant and the soil. So we've looked at that already in the last video. So they will attract negative ions. Uh, they act like negative ions, sorry, and they attract other positive ions like calcium, Na, which is sodium, and potassium. Okay, so they will be negative and they will attract positive ions to it. Um, and sometimes positive ions, so certain minerals will be naturally found in the soil and they will be positive. Or you could have a situation where you're adding in fertilizer and that is going to have lots of positive um ions in it as well the major nutrients in the soil are n p and k all right i've calcium and magnesium in there as well but n p and k are the main nutrients in the soil now we will be looking at that when we look at fertilizers in a few videos time but n is nitrogen p is phosphorus and k is potassium they're the main nutrients that are needed for plant growth and so therefore they're the main nutrients that are in soil you have minor nutrients such as iron manganese copper and boron so they would be in smaller amounts so kind of in the like in the human diet we have our major nutrients that we need like proteins fats carbohydrates and we also have trace elements and the trace elements like iron we would only need in small amounts it's the same principle here for the soil and um, this prevents the loss of these minerals by leaching so when you have clay and humus they're negative they will attract a lot of positive ions and so when they attract onto them they're going to stick onto them so if this is my clay and humus, and this is a positive um, ion, they're going to stick together. And so therefore, when the um, positive mineral can kind of stick onto the clay and humus, it's not going to be as easily leached, all right? And we looked at leaching already. 
we said leaching is the loss of minerals over a very, very short period of time because there's a prolonged period of precipitation. So clay particles will often stick together to form crumb structure. And when we talk about the crumb structure in agricultural science, we say that it's, it's another word for friable. So if you um, break up soil and it kind of has this crumb structure, it's very good in terms of fertility, nutrients, um, all of that. And that means that the clay and the humus are kind of sticking the, the minerals to it and there's not as much leaching. And colloidal humus has a high CEC. So we're going to look at that now in two minutes. Um, but that basically means that it's very good at kind of trapping um, certain particles and preventing them from being leached. Okay, so again, you can see here this little diagram. So you have your negative um, charges, so on your clay or, or your humus, and you can see lots of positive cations. The positive cations, so again, cations have a T in it, and T is kind of like the positive sign. And these would be cations that might be added in through fertilizer, they might be added in, or they might be found naturally in the soil, and they're going to stick onto the clay particles. And when we have this situation where we have the cations sticking onto the clay particles, there's not as much room for leaching, and so that's going to be better for the soil. So cation exchange capacity, what is it? Okay, so this is the ability, this is the ability of soil particles, clay and humus being the two main ones, to hold and to exchange plant nutrient cations. So how good are clay and humus at um, attracting those positive cations and kind of keeping them attached to themselves? Because remember, when we can have clay and humus attached to the cations, there's very, very little room for um, leaching to occur. And so therefore, there's not going to be mineral loss. If a soil can hold on to ions easily, this will prevent leaching of value of minerals. So I've said that already. So sandy soils have a low CEC, whereas clay soils have a high CEC. So I've highlighted there the um, C in clay and the C in uh, CEC. So that might help you to remember which soil is better at um, kind of holding on to its nutrients. So we've looked at sandy soils already and we said, yes, they're very good in terms of um, aeration. And they're very good in terms of drainage. They're not that fertile. And the reason that they're not that fertile is because they have a low CEC. They're not very good because there's very little clay or humus particles in sandy soils. Um, and sandy soils, the sand particles themselves are not negative. So they're not very good at sticking on to the positive cations. And when they can stick onto those cations, there is more room for leaching if heavy rainfall occurs. So cations are removed from the soil solution by plant roots and are replaced through cation exchange with the soil. So you constantly have, so if this is my clay or my um, humus particle, I constantly have cations sticking onto it and then they might go to another, um, to another soil particle and another one might stick on and another one might move off. So you have constantly this movement of um, cations. But if you have a high amount of clay, there'll always be the negative charges there for the positive cations to stick onto. Whereas with our sandy soil, there's very, very little clay, there's very, very little humus. And so there's not as much room for the cations to stick onto. So they are a little bit more prone to leaching and they're harder for the plant to absorb as well. CEC is important. Um, so the plants can uptake minerals such as magnesium, calcium and potassium quite easily. And how you can increase the CEC of the soil. So this is really important. So you can add slurry or add organic matter. So when you add slurry to soil, you're increasing the CEC because you're adding in the dead organic matter. You're adding in humus. You're adding in more organic matter um, and you are going to increase the um, CEC of it, even if it is a sandy soil. So by adding slurry to any type of soil, you're going to increase the CEC. Okay. So factors that affect the CEC. So humus content is the first one. So the more humus that is in a soil, the higher the CEC will be because humus and clay have negative charges and so they will attract the positive cations. Clay content, again, the more clay, the more negative um, charges that are there and they will attract the positive cations. Soil texture. So finely textured soils such as sand and silt um, may have a, a high CEC if slurry is added to them. So that's really important. Slurry does need to be added to them um, to allow them to have a high CEC. And pH. So as the pH of the soil increases, 
um, the, CA, the CEC level also increases as well. OK, so you do want your pH to be correct so that the CEC and this movement of um, cations and anions can be quite effective. OK, so the next thing that we're going to have a look at is flocculation. I'm actually going to go back to that diagram there. So what we have here are particles in two beakers. So in this beaker here, we can see um, a certain type of soil particles, maybe clay particle. And they're on their own whereas in with flocculation what occurs is that you have clumps of the particles sticking together so you can see them there they're kind of in pairs and that is what flocculation is that's a really good diagram to, to help you understand what it is so what is flocculation um, and this is the fourth thing that we look at in relation to the chemical aspect of soil so flocculation is the clustering together of clay particles to form aggregates what is an aggregate it's a clump um, of sand silt and clay Clay and humus particles attract the positive cations and attach to them so they cannot be leached by gravitational water. So we've talked about that already. Really, really important for the clay and the humus because they're negative. They will attract the positive cations and so you don't have very much leaching current. Over time, these cations will keep linking together. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a clay particle and you're going to have cations around it. You're going to have another clay particle and cations around it. And over time, they will link together. And when they link together over time and the water will kind of help bind them together, kind of like a chain or a link, what you're going to have is you're going to have eventually um, a very large um, clump or a very large aggregate in the soil. The flocculate is a chain of colloidal particles that are held together by water and the force of attraction between the water and the cations. So the water um, and the cations and the clay particles and the humus particles kind of nearly all come together like a magnet and that will form an aggregate. The flocculates will then uh, trap larger particles and eventually will form aggregates. So the cations that promote this process are aluminium, iron, calcium, magnesium, hydrogen, potassium and sodium. The calcium is one of the better ones, um, but any of them really will promote this whole flocculation. So if you add um, any of these cations to your soil, you are going to have, and if there's a high clay or humus content, you are going to have um, flocculation occurring and you are going to have your clumps of soil occurring. The advantages of flocculation. So why do we want soil particles to come together? Well, it creates a good soil structure. And when it creates good soil structure, there is going to be good pore spaces. So both the macro and the micro pores will be present. And that's needed for aeration and for drainage. It will also create friable soils. And friable soils are the soils that have the crumb structure. So when we look at a soil sample and there's a crumb structure present in it, that tells us that it's a very fertile and a good quality soil. Aeration, we've talked about that. That's needed for photosynthesis and that's needed for respiration. Drainage, really, really important because water is important to bring nutrients to the plants. It's really important for chemical reactions, for hydration. And also flocculation will create warmer soils because if you have good pore spaces present in it, you are going to have um, temperature, you know, kind of been a little bit more towards the optimum. So towards 20 to 30 degrees. Um, and that's obviously going to help your plant growth as well. OK, so they are the um, four different components in relation to the chemical aspects of soil. So, again, when we're looking at the chemical aspects of soil, we're looking like deep in the soil and we're looking at the chemical reactions that occur there. So colloidal properties, flocculation, CEC and pH. Thanks for listening. And until next time, happy learning.